Man, what a pleasure it is to have you guys here with us today. Uh, please pray for us as staff because if you guys keep coming, first service, uh, which is usually our lightest service, still had 70 people in it. So if you guys keep coming, it looks like we'll be moving to four services pretty soon. And uh, that's just a lot. So, so be praying for us to figure out how to do that well because we are out of space don't quit coming. We'll figure it out. All right? We'll figure it out. And in time, we'll all be together over there. Um, I, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. So I, Mike is optimistic. He thinks we'll be able to do one service for a couple of weeks. Uh, I don't know that we'll be able to when we go over there. So it will only hold 400 people. So we'll see. Thank you guys for coming and worshiping with us and uh, I just hope that, that God is blessing you and encouraging you and teaching you. And so join me, if you would, this morning in Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. We're going to be in Galatians for the next 12 weeks. And so we're going to go all the way through the book of Galatians. I've been wanting to do this for two years. And uh, it's something that I've been excited about, but just have not, I don't know, for one reason or another, just have not been ready to do and uh, now I am, I am completely excited about it and ready to, to walk through this. Galatians is a really small book in the New Testament. And it's, it's nestled with Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I was taught as a young person to God eats pineapple cake was how I could remember the, the order of that. God eats pineapple cake. So if you're always going, man, I don't remember which order Galatians falls into this. Uh, theologically speaking, God doesn't eat pineapple cake, so don't. Don't teach that to people, probably. But Galatians chapter 1, where we will be for 12 weeks, and uh, I can't wait. So here's what we have on tap today. Our theology is this. There was a false gospel infiltrating the early church. There was a false gospel infiltrating the early church. Our application today is this. We must be careful to believe only what is true about Christ. And our prayer today is God, teach us to be diligent students of the scripture. Teach us to be diligent students of the scripture. If you have little kids at home and you're wondering how do we talk to our little kids about today's message, the family focus this week is we have to be careful learners. We need to teach our kids carefully and we need to teach our kids to to be careful learners, to think through the things that they're being taught. That being said, jump in with me, if you would please, in Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, as we start talking about the false gospel infiltrating the early church. And I would argue is still infiltrating our churches today. But uh, Galatians 1, beginning in verse 1, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God, the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the other brothers who are with me to the churches in Galatia. Now, there's a lot I need to explain to you or unpack for you in these first two verses. I won't take a lot of time on it. I'm going to give you four Greek lessons today. This is not on the test anywhere. You do not need to remember this, but I do think it will be helpful for you in your future Bible study. So Paul, an apostle, the Greek word apostolos, uh, it's, it's a Greek word that we've just rendered apostle, but apostolos just means messenger. That's all it means, okay? So when it says Paul, an apostle, it's saying Paul, a messenger. We have kind of given it a different flavor uh, in a lot of churches, but that's what it means. Paul, a messenger, not from men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Now, this is very important that we believe and know that Christ was raised from the dead. We've talked about that in recent weeks, so I won't belabor the whole point again. But when, when in the book of Acts, Paul and other preachers were going and proclaiming the truth of Jesus Christ, if they said, Jesus died for our sins, no one batted an eye. But the moment he said, and then he was raised from the dead, that's where the division happened. And some people would say, oh, we don't want to hear about this anymore. You're crazy. And then they would say stuff like, you're out of your mind. And then other people would be like, no, I want to hear this. So I want you to keep in mind that Jesus' death on the cross has never been the dividing factor between the people who are hearing the message of God and those who believe it and those who don't. The dividing factor has always been the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why do we hold to the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Well, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that if Christ has not been raised from the dead, 
We're all still guilty of our sins. All of our preaching is pointless and all of our faith, all of our believing is pointless. We do not follow Jesus because he was just a good man or a moral teacher. We follow Christ because he is God and in him is righteousness and salvation and forgiveness of sins. And so, so this idea of Jesus being raised from the dead is vital and Paul begins his letter that way uh, to talk about Jesus. Now, he goes on to say in verse 3, uh, wait, was there something else? Oh, yeah, yeah. At the end of verse 2, to the churches of Galatia. I don't anticipate that many of you are going to care about this because it's, you don't have to. Like, uh, I, I don't think I cared about it until I was 47 and I'm 48 now. So, you know, if you, whatever, right? So, so here's what I will tell you. It is not cheating to read ahead. We're going to be in Galatians for the next 12 weeks. You want to read ahead? Do it. Read Galatians 100 times in the next 12 weeks. That'll be fine. Inevitably, at some point, when you go online to try to research the book of Galatians, I want to give you one thing that you're going to find that's going to make you a little uncomfortable. And I want to diffuse it for you now so that when you get online and you find this, you're not going, wait a minute. All right, so first of all, there is only general agreement about when Paul wrote his letters. And I say it that way, there's only general agreement. Like, if somebody says to you, we know for a fact that this was in 40 AD, we know for a fact this was 43 AD. No, they don't. No one does. We don't have any of the original manuscripts. The oldest manuscripts we have of Paul's letters date from the 2nd and 3rd century. All right? So, we don't know. We don't know for sure when Paul wrote it. But, here's, here's the point. There were two regions in Paul's day called Galatia. One was a Roman colony down on the island of Crete, I believe, and then the other one was in Asia, a region called Galatia. And people debate which one of these places is Paul writing his letter to. Who cares? All right? For real, who cares? So you're going to go and you're going to find... I, I land in one of those two camps and I land there... 87%. If you want to know if I'm pretty sure about something but not positive, I'll always say 87%. 100% of the time, I'll say 87%. So if you've ever asked me how sure are you, Ryan, and I say 87%, that means I'm as sure as I can possibly be about it. If it's anything less than 87%, basically what I'm saying is I have no clue. Okay? So now you know. There, there we have it. So I... I, I I feel that Galatians, the book of Galatians, nails down for us which of these two places is written to. I don't think it's significant for us to understand the text. If you want my opinion on it later, I'm happy to give you my 87% opinion. But don't let that be something that unseats you as you're studying Galatians. Paul wrote it to a group of churches, and the content of the letter is unchanged based on which location he sent it to. All right? So I know you're going, Ryan, I don't care about any of this. And you're right not to. That's okay. It really is. All right? Uh, verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now jump down with me to verse 6. I guess if you were following along with me, it's not a jump, right? Verse 6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him. This is God. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting God who called you in the grace of Christ and are now turning to a different gospel. So the Greek word gospel, here's, here's your next Greek lesson, the word gospel. Okay? Uh, the Greek word that we translate gospel here is euangelion. You do not have to know that. It's okay. It's where we get the word evangelist from, euangelion. And, and so... All it means, all the word gospel means is good news. That's all it means. Anytime you're reading your Bible and you see the word gospel, think good news. That's all it means. The word gospel can be a lot of stuff. It, it can, if, if we were to use this word, if we were to use euangelion, good news, gospel, in our day-to-day -day life, I would preach to you about Christ and say, I preached to you the good news. And then if... Uh, today, as I'm walking outside, uh, a winning lottery ticket from yesterday blows across and lands right underneath my foot, and I won 100, you know, or 900 million bucks. And I said, "Hey, I'm giving everybody in here a million dollars." Then that would be good news, right? Okay. And so, so that's the thing: is good news can be anything that's good news. It's just that most of the time that it's used in the Bible, it's speaking of the good news of Jesus Christ. Okay. And so it means good news. How did we arrive at the word gospel if it means good news? Great question. In old English Bibles, like 500, 600 years ago, in old English, uh, or moving forward from that, 
The word goad, G-O-D, meant good, and spiel, S-P-I-E-L, meant news. And so in Old English Bibles, it would say the goad spiel of Jesus, the good news or good message of Jesus. Eventually, they dropped the D of goad, and they dropped the I of spiel and pushed them together and turned two Old English words into one new English word. Goad spiel became gospel. What does it mean? That's all. Okay, now you know. And knowing is half the battle, G.I. Joe, it's a whole thing from the 80s, but only some of you will appreciate it. So, good. It's awesome. All right, so verse 6 again. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him. Every time, let me, I just got to say this. Every time I say, and now you know, every single time the G.I. Joe music plays in my head, and I'm like, and knowing is half the battle. Go, Joe. And it's just every time I say those words, it's in my head. Uh, it was my favorite cartoon in the 80s. So... <laughs> I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some people who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. So here's what he said. I'm astonished. I'm amazed that you are turning to a new gospel. There's not actually a new gospel, he says, but some people have come in and what they have done is they have troubled you and they are distorting the gospel of Christ. And he says, anybody who would teach this, and he says it in verse eight and he says it in verse nine, let them be accursed. Third Greek lesson, all right? This Greek word accursed means anathema. It means condemned to hell. Let them be, let them be condemned. It is it's not Paul going, we don't like guys who do that. It's Paul saying, guys who do this, who would teach a false gospel, let them be condemned to hell. Paul says, uses the exact same word in Romans 9, 3, where he says, I would choose to be anathema. Paul says, I would choose to be condemned to hell if it meant the entire nation of Israel would come to believe. He goes, I would give up my salvation if it meant all of Israel would believe. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 3, no one who is speaking by the Holy Spirit of God would ever say, Jesus be anathema, Jesus be cursed. And then he says in 1 Corinthians 16, 22, anyone who does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. So what Paul's saying here is that these false teachers, these people who are trying to undermine and distort the gospel of Christ, that what is destined for them, what is in store for them is anathema, being uh, condemned to hell. And he says this in verse 8. Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel, what's gospel mean? Good news. Even if we should preach to you good news, contrary to the one that we already preached to you, let him be accursed. Now, flip back a couple of pages, just two pages probably, to 2 Corinthians 11. Two pages should probably land you in 2 Corinthians 11. I'm going to again give you more information than you probably want, but I like the details, all right? So... This right here, you can't see it. It's a uh, see-through dry erase board, okay? It's got a map on your side. It's facing you correctly. This is your map in the back of the Bible of Paul's missionary journeys. Over here, we have Jerusalem. On the coast, we have Caesarea. Over here was his first missionary journey on this island. 325 miles north of Jerusalem is Antioch, where he makes his ministries base. This is Asia. Across the sea right here is Macedonia, where you have churches like Philippi and Thessalonica. You come down here and jog over, and here's Berea, and here's Athens, and you come down here, and here's Corinth. He's writing this letter to the people in Corinth. You don't have to know all this. This part kind of matters. I want you to understand. So Paul, on his first missionary journey with Barnabas, they come down here. They come back to Jerusalem. They go up to Antioch. Second missionary journey, he bypasses Asia, and he hangs out in Macedonia. And he ends up coming down to Corinth. The Bible tells us that he spent a year and a half in Corinth. He was the very first person to come and preach to them the good news of Jesus. No one had ever done that before. No one had ever preached the gospel of Christ. They didn't know who Jesus was. Paul comes and he's down here in Corinth and he preaches to them for a year and a half. After this, he sails back over here to Caesarea, goes inland to Jerusalem, comes back up to Antioch, and then he's in Asia for three years. Okay? In that time, a young preacher named Apollos travels over to Corinth and preaches and comes back. And then Paul travels up to Macedonia to revisit this, these churches. It has been about seven years since he's passed through this land, about seven or eight years. It's been about seven or eight years since he left Corinth, okay? 
And he hears in Corinth that now they're listening to false teachers. He hears that they are listening to teachers who are undermining the truth of Jesus and preaching a false gospel. All right? The entire book of 2 Corinthians has one topic. One. It addresses minor topics within that. But the entire book of 2 Corinthians is Paul ripping the Corinthian church for listening to false teachers. He's like, are you kidding me? After all the work I came and I did with you, he goes, why are you listening to these guys? And what had happened is from Jerusalem, they came over to Caesarea, some false teachers sailed over to Corinth, and they came in and they said, look how important we are. Everybody in Jerusalem thinks we're so important. Look at our letters of recommendation. They literally brought letters of recommendation. They said, here's why you should listen to us. Oh, that Paul guy, we're doing the same thing he's doing. You should listen to us instead. We're basically like Paul. And they are preaching a false gospel. That is the whole book of 2 Corinthians, all right? If you want to know how Paul feels about false teachers and charlatans, 2 Corinthians will give you a good indication of that. And because I cannot read to you the entirety of 2 Corinthians right now, I gave you that background so that 2 Corinthians 11 will make some sense. You ready? Everybody okay? Okay. Y'all are going, he won't have to worry about four services. I'm not coming back. This is way too much information. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul says, I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Please do bear with me, for I feel divine jealousy for you. He's jealous for the saints in Corinth. Since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. So Paul's saying, I presented you to Christ, and now somebody else is coming in and wrecking everything. Look at verse 3. I am afraid that just as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel, a different what? Good news from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. So, good job. So he, here's what he's saying. He goes, look, I came to you, spent a year and a half there, lived there, preached to you Jesus, and now some other guys are coming in and they're preaching something false. And he goes, they're giving you a different version of Jesus. They're giving you a different version of the Holy Spirit. They're giving you a different version of the gospel. And you believe it? You just accept it? You, you just go, oh, yeah, this sounds good. And he goes, are you kidding me? He goes, these people are coming in and they're preaching this false stuff. And then he says this, Paul is frequently sarcastic. Look at verse 5. He says, Indeed, I consider that I am not the least inferior to these super apostles. Paul is not paying them a compliment. He's being sarcastic when he calls them super apostles. Here's kind of how you should read that. He says, Indeed, I consider that I'm not the least inferior to these so-called super apostles, like these people who are going, look how good we are, look how important we are. And he says, even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not unskilled in knowledge. Indeed, in every way we've made this plain to you in all things. Paul says in verse 7, 11, 7, Did I commit a sin in humbling myself to you that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. Pause here for just a moment. In all of Paul's missionary journeys, every church aided Paul financially. Every church except for Corinth. Corinth is the only church that didn't aid him financially. They didn't help him along the way at all. And we don't know exactly why that is. We do know from 1 Corinthians chapter 9 that Paul says to the Corinthian church, he goes, when I came to you, I preached the gospel free of charge so that you would accept the gospel. So what that means is in all the other churches he's preaching, he's taking support from them while he's living among them. But there was something about the Corinthian church that Paul discerned. They won't hear me if I take payment from them, so I'll take nothing from them. We don't know what the background of that was. We don't know if there had been other charlatans who had come. We don't know. But Paul didn't take any money from the Corinthian church when he preached there. He goes on to say in verse 9, uh, And when I was with you and was in need, I didn't burden anyone there. Where, for the brothers who came from Macedonia supported my need. Also, also, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 tells us that the Macedonian churches were some of the poorest churches in the whole world at this point. So he says, the poor churches took care of me while I was with you in Corinth. Like, the poor churches were the ones that met my need. Anyway, that's just a neat little point. Uh, kind of a knock on the Corinthians, but anyway. Uh, and so he says in verse 10, As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I don't love you. God knows that I love you. Verse 12, what I am doing, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. 
So there are some people walking around, the people in Corinth going, oh yeah, we work on the same, we work on the same claim. We work on the same things that Paul does. And Paul goes, no, they don't. He goes, and I'm going to take every opportunity I can to undermine these false teachers and show you that they're not working in the same way that we're working. And look at what he says about them in verse 13. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ, and no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Have you heard that last verse there, verse 14 before? Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. People, people will use that all the time to warn you about the devil. A good opportunity might present itself or a perceivingly good opportunity might present itself and somebody will say, be careful, even an angel masquerades as, uh, even Satan masquerades as an angel of light. I want you to understand the context. The context here is false teachers. Be careful of false teachers who masquerade as servants of Christ because they're following the devil who masquerades as an angel of light. The, the context here is to be wary of the people who are teaching what is false. Be guarded against the people who are teaching what's not true. We'll get into just a moment how we can know that. And then look at what he says here in verse 15. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Now flip back over to Galatians, two pages back to the right. And what does Paul want to happen to the false teachers of the false gospel? What does he say about them? Let them be cursed. Let them be anathema. Let their end mimic their deeds. If they're going to be false, let them, let them be condemned, right? So there's some hints here. Paul says, look, if even an angel or somebody else comes and preaches to you something other than what we proclaim to you, he goes, you need to be careful because some of these people are, are like Satan deceiving Eve. They masquerade as angels of light. They masquerade as servants of Christ. And you, can, you need to be guarded against these false teachers. So there are a couple of clues here. One, we, we know that what he's going to be talking about in the book of Galatians is a false gospel. It's not just weak teaching. Some preachers are just weak teachers. It's not that what they're teaching is untrue. It's just kind of like baby food. Weak teaching is not what we're talking about here. It's not what Galatians is talking about. What Galatians is talking about is false teaching, that which is contrary to the person and the work of Jesus. But will it look initially contrary to the person and the work of Jesus? No, because just like Satan masquerades as an angel of light, so these people pretend to be ministers of righteousness. They look like ministers of righteousness, all right? Verse 10. Well, let's move on. Here's our application, and then I'll come to verse 10. Our application today is this. We must be careful to believe only what is true about Christ. We must be careful to believe only what is true about Christ. Listen to what Paul says in verse 10. Uh, Galatians 1.10. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Am I still trying to please men? If I were trying to please men, I would not be the servant of Christ. A couple of things I want you to note in this. One, you cannot aim to be pleasing to God and also aim to be pleasing to men. Those things don't mix. If you're trying to be pleasing to mankind, Paul says, I'm not a servant of Christ. If I'm trying to be pleasing to man, if I'm trying to serve man, I'm not a servant of God. You, when you wake up in the morning, your life is set as a servant of God or you're set as a servant of men. And here's a hint in this in verse 10, to be a servant of men is part of what this false gospel is about. Part of what this false teaching is about. And so we wake up and we say, we are servants of God. And we won't be taken in by false teaching. I want you to notice something else that Paul says. Look at 10.1. Sorry, 1.10. He says, am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? What's the answer to that question? Who's he seeking the approval of? God. Am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Look at verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ. Verse 1 and verse 10 tie together. We usually don't see that because we ignore the introduction and then we go straight into the meat of the thing. But verse 1 and verse 10, Paul says, I am not a, an apostle because men have called me an apostle. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ because God has called me an apostle. And he goes, and I'm not trying, verse 10 now, I'm not trying to please man, I'm trying to please God. Does that make sense? So this Galatians is going to talk about a false gospel that has at its core trying to please men rather than trying to please God, okay? Now, I want to give you a couple of thoughts on this. Flip, if you would, to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. So, second missionary journey. We have our map again. Paul was up here in Macedonia. 
The people in Thessalonica tried to kill him, so he ran away. He ends up in a city called Berea. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 10. The brothers, that's the people who had been converted to faith in Thessalonica and a few of his other friends, the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Now, very, very important theological point in this text. Okay. So Paul comes and he preaches to them the word of Christ. And then what do the Bereans do? They check the scripture to see if it's true. A couple of thoughts on this. This is your last Greek lesson for the day. The word that we see here that's translated word is logos. All it means is message. That's all it means. It means the message. It could be the message that the shepherds gave to Mary and Joseph. It could be the message that somebody gave of, hey, uh, you know, we got a new horse. It could be anything. In the Bible, sometimes, as in this case, it is the message of Christ. It is the word of Christ. So whenever you see that phrase, the word of Christ, it means what? The message of Christ. That's all it means, okay? So it's the message of Christ, the proclamation of Christ. And then they examined the scriptures to see if it was true. This is a different word. This is the Greek word graffete, and it means the writings, so there is the message, and then there is the writings. That feels like a very obvious distinction, doesn't it? The message and the what? The writings. When Paul is talking about the scripture, he uses the word the writings. When he's talking about the message he proclaimed, he uses the word word. I came to you and proclaimed to you a word. I proclaimed to you a message from the writings. Two different things. I grew up in church believing that every time you saw the word word in the Bible, it meant the scripture. You need to study the word. What do I mean when I say that? If you grew up in church, what does that mean? Study the word means what? Yes, study the scripture. But that's not how the Bible uses it. What we mean is study the scripture, right? If you became a believer today, if you put your faith in Jesus this moment, and you're like, man, I am convinced Jesus is God, you might not know the scripture, but you know the word, right? Right? Because the message is the message of Christ. You become a believer today. My buddy Jade, he, he puts his faith in Jesus today. He's already a Christian. Don't worry about him. So my buddy Jade puts his faith in Jesus today. He's never cracked the spine of a Bible in his life. He could go to work and tell his friends the word of Jesus. Let me tell you who Jesus is. Let me tell you the message of Jesus. He would be proclaiming to them the word. Would he be proclaiming to them the scripture? No. Okay? So don't make... When you read the New Testament, don't make the word word Bible. Don't do that to yourself. It's the message. Read that as the message. So he comes, Paul comes, and he gives them the message. It's what I'm doing to you now. I'm giving you the message. And then what do the Bereans do? They examine the scriptures every day to check them. They're checking who? Paul. Who now, from, in retrospect, we go wrote two-thirds in the New Testament. If you aren't checking me, and the Bereans checked Paul, maybe you're missing a part of this. Check me. Check me to see if what I'm saying is actually in the scripture. If what I'm saying is actually correct. And because here's the, here's the kicker. If you're not checking me, you're not checking the next person or the next person or the next person or the podcast or the sermon or the song. You're not checking those things and all of that forms your theology. You just start taking stuff in. We have to be careful. Now, we have to be careful, and I have a general rule. This is for me. I'm not putting this rule on you. I refuse personally to hold a theological position that's supported by only one verse. I will not form a theological position supported by only one verse. Why? For me, too many opportunities for me to be wrong about it. I want a theological position that's supported by multiple places in the scripture so that I can better understand it. That's just me. I'm not putting that on you. If you adopt that as a study technique, I think it'll safeguard you in some ways, but that's just me. I'm not telling you to do that. But here's why it matters. Here I am. I'm a preacher. I get up in front of you, and I preach to you, and I say, listen, it's a new year. I have a fake preacher voice that I use sometimes, and I'm like, it's a, it's a new year. It's time for a new you. Do you feel it? You feel like the dawn of the newness, like it's, <clears throat> and I just want you to know, people, I want you to know that we can't know the ways of God. We can't know the thoughts of God. 
Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, and my ways are higher than your ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts above your thoughts, and my ways above your ways. We can't know the ways of God, but my goodness, we're going to try. And you leave going, yeah, the Bible says his thoughts are higher than my thoughts. His ways are higher than my ways. And you leave, and you think you know something, but you've actually been duped. You've actually been misled. Let me show you why. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 does say, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. But verse 6, sorry, verse 7 says, Let the wicked man forsake his ways. Let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he can have compassion on them. Let them return to God for he will abundantly pardon them. For my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. Whose thoughts aren't the thoughts of God? The wicked. Whose ways aren't the ways of God? The unrighteous. Not the people committed to him. Not the people who know Jesus. The Bible tells us in Romans 12, 1 and 2 that we can know the thoughts and the ways of God. The Bible tells us in Romans 12, 1 and 2 that we can know what is the perfect and pleasing will of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 says we have the Holy Spirit who knows and understands the depths of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 16 says we have the mind of Christ. We can know what God wants us to do. We can know the ways of God. We can know the thoughts of God. So hear me say this. When you go, well, I think the Bible teaches X, Y, and Z because it says so. And you bring up one verse. What I need you to do if you're going to be like the Bereans is go, but why do I believe that that verse means that? Where did I get that teaching from? Jeremiah 29, 11 is the most wrongly used verse probably in the whole Bible. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And people go, man, it's a new year, Jeremiah 29, 11. God has plans for me, plans to prosper you, not to harm me. Listen, Jeremiah 29 in total The whole chapter is a letter that Jeremiah wrote to the Jews who had been taken into Babylonian captivity. They've been there for 13 years. They're going to be there for 57 more. And the verse right before that, verse 10, he says, listen. He goes, after 70 years are completed for you in Babylon, God will bring you back to Jerusalem and rebuild the city for God knows the plans he has for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. He's not talking about everybody in the world. He's talking about a group of exiles, Jewish exiles in Babylon. Here's here's the kicker. Eight chapters earlier, Jeremiah in Jerusalem to the people who were rejecting God at that point, Jeremiah says, God has plans to harm you and not to prosper you, plans to destroy you in this city. It's the exact opposite of what he says in the letter to the exiles. No one's walking around going, God gave me a verse for me this year. The verse is, he has plans to harm me and not prosper me. No one's doing that. Because in that case, and I had this conversation, like, in that case, people will go, well, that's not what it means there. You're right. But it's also not what it means in Jeremiah 29. We have to know the context. So don't support your position just because you heard a verse one time. You have to know why that verse is there, who it's written to, what the context is. And you're going, Ryan, that's a lot of work. Yes, it is. Be like the Bereans and diligently study the scriptures daily so that you can see if what you're taking in is true. It's okay to be wrong. Like your questions, your questions about what you believe, please hear this. Your questions about what you believe cannot undo the truth of God. They can't. You cannot destroy the truth of God by your questions. You know what you can destroy? Bad theology. Ask all the questions you want. Now, here's the problem. Most of us growing up are taught to hold more tightly to our theology than we are to hold to Christ. So then when our theology, what we believe, theology means the study of God, if that's too fancy a word. So when our study of God, when the things that we believe about God begin to get broken down because somebody goes, hey, you believed this wrong, we feel like we're losing connection to Christ, but we're not. You're actually just removing all the stuff that keeps you from standing on the foundation. And it's okay, it's a little bit scary for like anywhere from one to five years. And, and, and then it's not terrifying if you have other people around you who are also doing the same thing. And, and you're going, look, I just want to believe what is true. This is our, our application today. I want to believe what is true about Christ. If I've been wrong about something, show me, God, where I've been wrong and remove that so that I can have my feet firmly planted on the truth of Jesus. You cannot undo what is true You can only undo what is false. And so ask all the questions. Now, let me give you a couple of examples kind of in our culture. 
there's a video. It won't be hard for you to find. I have no idea what you'll need to type in to Google it, but you'll, you'll figure it out. You're intelligent people. And, and so one of the things to, to consider is there's this video that was floating around about 10 years ago, and, and uh, it's a prank show, and they set, up, they set up an eye doctor's office. I think it was an eye doctor's office. And there are six people who are in on the prank, waiting in the waiting room, and then there's somebody who comes in with a legitimate appointment, and they sit down. And about a minute and a half, two minutes in, there's a little buzzer that goes, meh, and the six people who are in on it stand up and then sit back down. And the person who's not in on it, like, kind of looks at everybody standing up, and they're like, okay, that's weird. And then a few minutes later, the buzzer goes off again, and the six people stand up, and that person's like, Watching them all stand up, like, okay, that's strange. The third time the buzzer goes off, what does the person who's not in on it do? Stands up, okay? One by one, one by one, the people who are in on it get taken into the office to go for their eye appointment, and one by one, those seats get filled by other people who aren't in on it until the whole room is filled with people who aren't in on it. But they all know now to stand up whenever the buzzer goes off. And a new person comes in, and they sit down, and the five who weren't in on it at all are standing up with the buzzer, and the new person's like, what? And they go, you got to stand. And they're like, why? And they're like, you just have to. <laughs> See, some of you have theology like that. You've been standing up every time the buzzer goes off and you have no idea why. Ask the dang questions, people, right? Ask the questions. There was another experiment that they did uh, where they, they gave, so like my buddy Steve White over here, if I went to him and I just dropped a name, made up a name, just completely dropped a random name, said, hey, have you ever heard of so-and-so? And he's like, no. And I'm like, oh, well, never mind. And then I got three or four other people to drop that same name to him. Have, have you ever heard of so-and-so? By the end of the week, he would be like, who is this person? And then in this test, what they did is they went to these people that they had primed for a week with three or four examples. That was it. They went to the people and they had a long list of names and they say, circle every celebrity on here. Every single person who had been primed, every single one circled that made-up name. Why? They're convinced it's a celebrity. Why? Three other people had already mentioned it to him earlier in the week. They just didn't know who it was. It must be someone famous. We do that with our theology. Two or three people that we really believe mention something to us, and we're just like, oh, that must be right. That must be how it is. And we don't ever ask. We don't ever ask, where'd you get this, or what's the context? I, I have told our Wednesday night Bible study that the easiest thing you can do when somebody is sharing theology with you, to every person, me included, to every person go, okay, what's the context of that verse that you're reading to me? And if they can't tell you, be a little more skeptical than you would be if they could explain it to you. It might not be that they're wrong, but at least be skeptical. And I'll leave you with this last anecdote that you've probably heard. It's a very old one, and I don't know if it's actually real, but it's funny. Man and wife are married. She's cooking a pot roast or a brisket. She cuts the ends off. After five years of marriage, the husband goes, why do you cut the ends off of the pot roast? Every week you cut the ends off the pot roast. And she goes, well, yeah, that's just what you do. That's what my mom always did. It's just what you do. So he goes, why though? And she goes, I don't know. Call mom. Calls mom. Mom, why do you cut the ends off the, the pot roast? And she goes, well, it's how your grandmother taught me to do it. You know, and that's what I always did. My mom always did that, and I passed that on to you. So she goes, okay, thanks, mom. Gets off the phone, calls grandmother. Grandmother, I want to know why you cut the ends off the pot roast. She goes, well, when your grandfather and I got married, we were really poor, and I had a very small pan. That was, that was it. She had a small pan. Some of you are cutting the ends off of your theological pot roast because your grandmother had a small pan, and you have no idea why you're doing it. I am telling you, listen to me carefully. You, you got to quit just believing things just because someone tells you. Check me. Check your other teachers. Ask me hard questions. Come to me and say, hey, I think you're wrong about this, and let's talk about it. it I'll just say it this way. If you leave us, if, if, we're, if this church isn't for you and you end up somewhere else, and the, the pastor is not willing to be questioned, be guarded. Because that's somebody who thinks way too highly of themselves. I, I already know that I'm an idiot. So I, I know that I get things wrong. So when you come to me and ask me questions, you're helping me. Because either I'm right and we'll be able to, I'm like, that's a question I haven't considered and we'll be able to figure it out and I'll be like, okay, yeah, yeah, this helps. Or I'm wrong and your question reveals that. But ask the dang questions. Don't just believe it because someone says it. Because what had happened in Galatia in the regions of Galatia, is some people came in and they were undermining the truth of the gospel. And the people, like in Corinth, just accepted it readily. We gotta be careful.
And so be good students of the word, study the scripture, ask the hard questions. And I can't wait to unpack the false gospel of Galatia or of the book of Galatians with you in the coming weeks. Here's our prayer today. God, teach us to be diligent students of the scripture. Would you take a moment to pray that where you're seated? God, I thank you for the message of Jesus Christ. I thank you for the scripture which teaches and proclaims him to us. I ask, God, that you would help us to be diligent students of the scripture. That at whatever level we are in our faith, that we would at least be disciplined enough to ask the hard questions. God, we don't have to understand 1,189 chapters of the Bible today. We don't have to understand every nuance and all the Greek language, but we do, Lord, want to be careful that what we believe about Jesus is right. I pray, God, that you give us wisdom. I pray for myself and Pierce and Micah and Darren, the pastors of this church, that you would help us to teach faithfully only that which is true. And God, where we are wrong, that we would be quick to correct it. I ask, God, that you would set our hearts and our minds on you. And I pray, Lord, that as we read through Galatians together over these coming weeks, that we would recognize what is false and that we would guard ourselves against it for your name and for your glory and for your honor.